Good evening, everybody. Welcome. We are going to start up. Uh, I'm Gabriel Rosenfeld, the new president here at the Center for Jewish History, and I'm very happy to welcome everybody to this evening's lecture, which kicks off the latest phase of our exhibition, How Jews Became Citizens. I hope you've all had the chance to see the exhibit itself. If you haven't, you can pop in later or at any point in time uh, in the coming weeks. It's going to be up until early March, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and it may be the case that some of you were with us a couple weeks ago when we kicked off the public um, uh, events associated with this exhibit when we had a roundtable discussion with professors David Sorkin, Marsha Rosenblatt, and Daniel Schwartz on the history of Jewish emancipation in Europe. Tonight, needless to say, we're going to be shifting gears a little bit, moving into the Mediterranean world, North Africa, and the Middle East, and we'll be turning over uh, the microphone to Professor Jessica Marglin from USC, but I would prefer to introduce Miriam Mora, Dr. Miriam Mora, our Director of Programming, to do the formal introduction. And with that, we will move on with our program. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight uh, in the rain. We really appreciate it. It's nice to see people back in person. Um, as Dr. Rosenfeld said, my name is Dr. Miriam Mora. I'm the Director of Academic and Public Programming here at the Center. And I'm pleased to welcome you today for this exciting talk with Dr. Jessica Marglin, the first of a series of three Sid Lapidus lectures, which were created to expand upon the collection and exhibition, uh, How Jews Became Citizens, which tells a, the complex ongoing story of the Jewish people's path to emancipation in Europe across centuries. This program has been made possible by the generous support of Sid and Ruth Lapidus, as well as the New York State Council of the Arts, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Tonight, Professor Marglin will trace the modern history of Jewish citizenship in North Africa and the Middle East, including nationality legislation, the abolition of dhimmi status, the status of Jews in European colonies, and their citizenship in independent nation states. I'll ask you to hold your questions. There will be time for a Q&A at the end, and I will come around with the microphone um, to so that you can ask your questions and we can capture them on the recording. So I do ask that after you're called on, you wait until you have the microphone to speak. Jessica Marlin is Associate Professor of Religion, Law, and History and the Ruth Ziegler Early Career Chair in Jewish Studies at the University of Southern California. She earned her PhD from Princeton and her BA and MA from Harvard. Her research focuses on the history of Jews and Muslims in North Africa and the Mediterranean with a particular emphasis on law. She is the author of Across Legal Lines, Jews and Muslims in Modern Morocco, and The Shamama Case, Contesting Citizenship Across the Modern Mediterranean, which, as of a couple days ago, was announced as a finalist for the National Jewish Book Award. So very exciting to have her here with us. Um, please join me in welcoming Professor Jessica Marglin. Hello. Nice to see you all. Thank you for coming out on a rainy, cold New York night. And really, first of all, thank you so much to Gabrielle and to Miriam. Gabrielle and Miriam have been wonderful hosts and coordinators, and it's really an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I am going to start with some stories, which hopefully will make sense as the lecture progresses, but I think uh, history is most fun when we're able to kind of bring these historical characters to life and make something like citizenship law, which some people are like, oh, law, uh, dry, and uh, lawyer, law school, no. But, uh, you know, the, these were real people who actually lived through these events and these transformations. And that's part of our job as historians, too, is to bring those real people to life. So I'll begin with the story of a man named Nisim Shamama, whom I've been living with for quite a while. And Nisim was a Jew born in Tunis in 1805. He had this kind of rags to riches life. He started out not rags, really, but you know, relatively humble guy, and ended up being the minister of finance in charge of all of the taxation for Tunisia, which, by the way, at the time was a semi-autonomous province of the Ottoman Empire. So you'll hear me talking about the Ottoman Empire and Tunisia separately because they had sort of separate legislation, but they were actually also related to each other in any case. 
Um, but then 1864, there's a civil war in Tunis. Um, Nisim Shamama starts to worry that he's going to get in trouble because the cause of the civil war is higher taxes and he's in charge of taxation. So it's a good time to leave town. He gets on a boat with his family, um, including his great niece, whom I'll talk about in a second, moves to Paris, then eventually to Livorno, which is in Italy, uh, in Tuscany, it's like the port city of Tuscany. So if you've been to Florence, it's like the poor relative of Florence, although it's very nice, I highly recommend it. Um, and then suddenly in 1873, he died, leaving this vast fortune and no children, or at least no biological children. He had this sort of favorite great niece. <laughs> Um, as often is the case when a very wealthy person dies, there was a big fight over his estate. And it centered on the will that he had written when he lived in Paris in Judeo-Arabic, which was the only language that he was literate in. Judeo-Arabic, for those of you who don't know, is Arabic or an Arabic dialect written in Hebrew letters. Um, he spoke Arabic and he did a lot of his correspondence in Arabic, but he himself couldn't write in Arabic, so he would have secretaries write for him. And we know that he didn't speak French. We're pretty sure that he didn't speak Italian either. Anyway, so in this will, he left half of his fortune to Aziza, his sort of adopted great niece, and that little boy there, also named Nisim in honor of the Nisim Shamama. Um, and, you know, they were going to be set up for life. He was very wealthy, not quite Rothschild wealthy, but like almost Rothschild wealthy. So this was quite a lot of money at stake. However, um, if the will was not upheld, then Kaid Momo, Aziza's estranged father and Nisim Shamama's estranged nephew, would inherit a huge chunk of the fortune, and Aziza would get cut out. She would get nothing. So how were they going to decide? Well, it was under the jurisdiction of Italian courts, actually, and it all came down to the question of Nisim Shamama's nationality. If he was determined to have become an Italian national, which was quite possible because he had moved to Italy, had gotten a decree of naturalization from the king of Italy, no less, he lived his life as an Italian. Everybody thought he was an Italian when he died. So if indeed he had died an Italian national, Italian law was going to apply to his estate, will would be upheld, Aziza was going to get her millions, no problem. But there was some sort of fine print that he hadn't followed on the naturalization decree. He hadn't filed his naturalization decree properly. He hadn't taken the right oath that he was supposed to take with the right official. And if it was determined that actually he had never become Italian and he was still Tunisian, then Tunisian law was going to apply to his estate, to the will. And if that was the case, Tunisian Jews are under Jewish law, halakha, for, certain, for lots of things, but definitely for things like inheritance and marriage and divorce. And in that case, Kaid Momo would get a huge chunk of the estate and Aziza would be completely cut out. So that's what the lawyers and the heirs realized they had to figure out what was Nisim Shamama's nationality. And it only took 10 years, three lawsuits, millions and millions of francs and lira in lawyers' fees and court fees to finally figure it out. I'll come back to this later in the talk. But before that, I want to go to another story on the other side of the Mediterranean in a place called Çanakale, which is on the sort of other side of the Sea of Marmara from Istanbul, um, a small city, but with a very old and important Jewish community. And in this town, um, two Jews with the name of Russo got in a little bit of legal trouble. Uh, they were dragomen, dragomen being the term for sort of official translators at consular courts um, in the Ottoman Empire. And in 1861, first I'll tell you about Behor Levi, later on I'll tell you about this other guy, um, but Behor Levi Russo found himself embroiled in a lawsuit. In a lawsuit. Um, this was sort of 1861, uh, so, you know, um, there, the Ottoman Empire was still very strong, right? The, Turkey was not yet on the horizon, right? We're really still in the sort of heyday of the Ottoman Jewish experience. Um, and Russo was being sued by his co-religionist, another Jew named Mordechai ben Nachmias, who lived in Istanbul. Um, and actually the commandos were involved, if you know the commando family, a very kind of big Ottoman Jewish family who eventually left for Paris, but anyway. Um, 
Yes, the yes, and and a, in in Paris, yes, I saw that. That was a fabulous exhibit, um, and uh, you know, Russo did the thing that any smart guy would do, which is that he started a counter lawsuit. Right, he was being sued by Nachmia, so he said, "Well, I'm going to turn around and sue you." But Russo did this by going through the American consulate in Chanakale, saying that he was an American protege, meaning he was under American consular protection, which meant he was sort of protected from the Ottoman legal system. I'll tell you all about protection and consulates in more detail later on, but for now, just know that this was going to be a big advantage to Russo. Ben Nachmias was, of course, very surprised because he said, well, no, Russo is not an American protege. He's an Ottoman, just like me. So we have to go through the Ottoman legal system. Um, and this went on and on. And again, we'll, we'll circle back to the Russos. But for now, remember this kind of game of deciding whether he's an American or an Ottoman. Finally, I want to introduce you to a man named Eli Leon Enos. Unfortunately, we don't have a photo of him, at least not one that I've found. He was a Jew born in Algiers in 1833, just after France had conquered Algiers and made it part of the French Empire. He studied law in metropolitan France. Um, he moved to France, got his law degree there um, in 1858. He was admitted to the bar in Paris. He practiced law for a little while, but he got homesick. He decided he wanted to go back to Algiers. So he moved back to Algiers and applied to be a member of the bar there and expected it to be no problem because he was already a member of the bar in Paris, right? It shouldn't be a problem to become a member of the bar in Algiers. But when he returned, the local bar association said he could not be admitted to the bar. Why? Because as an Algerian, it wasn't clear if he was a French national. It wasn't clear if he had French nationality and only French nationality, French nationals, Frenchmen, men at the time, could be admitted to the bar. And this prompted a whole lawsuit about whether Algerians were French nationals or not. Again, we'll circle back to all of these stories. I want to introduce these people in some ways to give you a taste of what citizenship does and does not mean for Jews in the Middle East and North Africa in the long 19th century. I'm telling you these stories also in part because, frankly, I don't know if this is going to be disappointing, but there's no way I'm going to get to everything that one could possibly say about the history of citizenship for Jews in the Middle East and North Africa in the next 40 minutes. Um, so I want to try to kind of give you a sense of the field, right? And part of my argument is actually that citizenship in the Middle East and North Africa looks very different from citizenship for Jews in Europe and North America. So of course, this talk is part of this series occasioned by the really, truly marvelous exhibit. And again, if you haven't seen it, you absolutely must. It's beautifully done. It has fabulous sort of rare things that most of which I've never seen, some of which I've heard about, but never seen. So it's very exciting. Um, and you know, the, the exhibit bills itself as an exhibit about emancipation of Jews in Europe and North America. And the idea of emancipation is, in some ways, a pretty sort of Western idea, right? And in some ways, it doesn't, that construct doesn't really apply to the experience of Jews in the Middle East and North Africa for reasons that hopefully I'll explain today. The main thing that I would sort of in, in emphasize is that the idea of emancipation or even citizenship as it is usually thought about assumes a certain model of equality, a model of equality in which everybody has the same rights and is subject to the same laws. Now, this, first of all, just to be very clear, I'm not against that model of equality. I think it's a great model. I also think it's it's somewhat aspirational still in America in many ways. I mean, it might be de jure what's going on, but de facto there are many ways in which we haven't achieved that kind of radical equality, but it's a great idea. Um, nonetheless, I just want to point out that even today, for many Jews, that is not actually the applicable model of equality if you think of the state of Israel. The state of Israel is a place where citizens of different religions might have equal political rights, but they have different civil rights. Because Jews, 
living in the state of Israel are under the rabbinate for matters of personal status, marriage and divorce in particular. Right now, we're not going to comment on whether that's good or bad or what we think of the rabbinate because that is outside of the scope of this lecture. But it is just a point to sort of sensitize you to the ways in which this radical equality that we normalize in America isn't what everybody in the world sort of aspires to. And of course, Muslims in Israel are subject to Sharia, to Islamic law, Christians are subject to their, the laws of their respective churches, etc. And in many ways, the model in Israel is a kind of heir to what was going on in the Ottoman Empire before Mandate Palestine and then before the creation of the State of Israel. The other thing that I'll just say is that, especially when we're talking about the 19th century, the model of radical equality that we tend to sort of associate with emancipation is really still very rare. It only exists in a few places. And that's one of the great things about the exhibit is it shows just how piecemeal and almost painful and a, you know sort of two steps forward, one step back, or sometimes one step forward and two steps back process emancipation was, right? One of the things that I try to, that I want to sort of convince you of today is that the idea that all Jews in the Middle East and North Africa were going towards this model of radical equality was not necessarily shared, certainly by most people in the Middle East and North Africa, and even by many Jews, right? That was not the presumption that that was where everybody wanted to get. On the contrary, there were all of these different ways of belonging that really looked quite different from this sort of radical equality model that is basically what I wanted, that is the sort of operative logic behind my title, right? Citizen, national, subject, protege. The idea is precisely that there are all of these different ways of belonging. So let me say a little bit about each of these four modes of belonging. First of all, citizen, citizenship, in some ways is the most um, familiar term, but it's, it could also be the most misleading because it is used to mean all sorts of things. Um, including, you know, civic inclusion and, and sort of your feeling about being part of whatever country you're part of, et cetera. But when lawyers and jurists use it, they tend to mean a sort of more narrow sense of the term by which they are talking about the status of having full political and civil rights, right? However, that status is pretty much not applicable to the history of Jews in the Middle East and North Africa, with one major exception, which is Algeria, and I'll get to that. So in fact, citizen in this kind of legal sense of the term, this juridical sense of the term, is not a term we're going to talk about that much tonight. Subject, on the other hand, is very applicable in some ways because it is super capacious, right? It doesn't say anything particularly about what rights you have. It's really about under whose jurisdiction you live, under whose sovereignty do you live, right? Um, and this is certainly applicable for the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and I will discuss in particular sort of the, 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 the ways in which Jews and other non-Muslims experienced subjecthood in the Middle East, North Africa, especially in the sort of early part of the 19th century and before certain reforms that really did start to change the nature of subjecthood for non-Muslims. I also want to talk about this word national. Now, national, nation, nationality, nationhood, this is also like citizenship, one of these very slippery terms which can, which can mean lots of things, right? A nation, of course, Jews sometimes think of themselves as a nation in a very capacious sense. But again, for jurists, nationality or national has a pretty specific meaning, and it means a kind of bare bones version of state membership. So whereas a citizen has full, legal and political rights, a national is just a member of the state, really kind of like a subject. But this is a 19th century term that comes to be accepted as the kind of term of art to describe this sort of bare bones relationship with a state. And in fact, Jews, as we'll see, are sort of central to the process by which jurists started to define what it meant to have nationality. And then finally, protege. This might be the most unfamiliar to you, certainly in this context of a talk about citizenship, um, because it describes essentially an obsolete category, a category that basically doesn't exist anymore and certainly doesn't exist um, in the way that it did in the 19th century. 
A protege describes a person with extraterritoriality. Extraterritoriality, I'll describe it more later um, in greater detail, but it's basically like diplomatic immunity for non-diplomats, right? In the sense that like, if I were the American ambassador to France, I would have diplomatic immunity. I wouldn't be fully subject to French laws and I wouldn't be I wouldn't have to pay taxes in the same way that regular Americans in France do, et cetera, et cetera. This extraterritoriality was similar, but it applied to all Westerners and Ottoman and Moroccan people, Jews and non-Jews, who got this protection in one way or another. So one of the things that I want to kind of suggest is that all of these different categories um, often get sort of, I think, mislabeled as citizenship or get uh, sort of cut out of conversations as, of citizenship. And I think they should all be part of how we think about citizenship and debates about belonging. And so I want to introduce a term that I came up with to try to kind of be capacious and understand all of these terms in a single umbrella, which is legal belonging. Like these are all different ways to legally belong to a state, but they're different, right? Citizenship is one thing, nationality is another thing, protection is another thing, et cetera. And so what I want to do is kind of go through each of these modes of belonging and try to introduce you to the different ways in which Jews in the Middle East and North Africa ha experience legal belonging, right? So in some ways, we're, we're really going to put citizenship off the table for now, and then I'll come back to it. I'm going to save citizen for the very end, and I'll come back to it later on, hopefully in a way that will make sense. So let's start with subjecthood. Um, again, because in some ways it's kind of the most neutral. It doesn't really tell us much about the particular status of Jews. Um, so what we need to know when we're thinking about Jewish subjects in the Middle East and North Africa is the term vimma and vimni. These are Arabic terms. Vimma means lots of things, actually, but in the context of Jews, it means protection. And ahl dhimma, the people of protection, refer to non-Muslims, not only Jews, Christians as well, um, but for our purposes, we'll call them dhimmis, that is those people who are protected, who live under Islamic sovereignty. And dhimmis have certain kinds of rights and guarantees. So they have the right, first of all, to live under Islamic sovereignty. They have the right to practice their religion. They have the right to... Uh, significant degree of autonomy, right? So Jews historically in the Islamic world ran a robust sort of system of Jewish courts, Bate Din, which had a lot of sovereignty over intra-Jewish matters and sometimes even dealt with non-Jews, right? Muslims and Christians would even sometimes come to the Jewish courts to do business, to get contracts, et cetera, et cetera. In exchange for this pretty significant autonomy and guarantee, Vimmis had to agree to a kind of subservient social status, and that was marked in various ways. It was marked in part by agreeing to pay special taxes, a tax called the jizya, which was the kind of most sort of through line in terms of the ways in which Vimmis experienced their status as Vimmis throughout the Islamic world and pretty much throughout most of Islamic history. And then there were a whole other set of restrictions like not riding horses, wearing different clothing, not building your houses higher than Muslim houses, things like that, which were enforced or not enforced very differently depending on the time and place. So there were places where Jews really, you know, were kind of lived this sort of separate and distinct life. And then there were other places where Jews were extremely integrated and basically everybody just flouted all of these rules about technically being lower than Muslims. One thing though that is really important to emphasize is that unlike in Europe, where much of Europe just expelled Jews at one point or another, or where if Jews lived there, it was sort of at the grace of whatever sovereign was in charge. In the Islamic world, Jews had a built-in guarantee through Islamic law. And this is part of what makes emancipation a tough term for understanding the history of Jews in the Middle East and North Africa, because in some ways they, were, they never had to be emancipated because they were never excluded, right? There was a hierarchy, there were restrictions, there was difference for sure, but there was never outright exclusion. And similarly, Jews were allowed to own property, they were allowed to practice any profession they wanted. Um, political rights, not exactly because Jews couldn't be like the Sultan, but Jews like Nisim Shamama did regularly throughout the history of Jews in the Islamic world get to very high ranking positions in Islamic 
in, in Islamic polities, right? So Nisim Jumama was exceptional in the sense that there weren't that many Jewish ministers of finance at the time in Tunis, in, in Tunis, but there were lots of Jewish high-ranking ministers throughout the history of Jews in the Islamic world. So again, that's you know part of what makes the emancipation model a bad fit when we're talking about Jews in the Middle East and North Africa, and that's part of why I'm emphasizing all of these other ways in which Jews belonged or you know sometimes didn't. Okay, the status of Zimmi became a kind of flashpoint in the 19th century, in, in large part, not exclusively, but in large part because uh, European Christians were, saw the sort of differentiated status of Zimmis in the Islamic world as very problematic, not really because they cared about the Jews, most of them didn't, but because they cared about Christians. And in the Ottoman Empire, there was an enormous population of indigenous Christians. And so there was a lot of sort of pressure on the Ottoman Empire to change the relationship between Vimis and Muslims. And in 1856, the Ottoman Empire, in the midst of the Crimean War, basically the French and British ambassadors put a lot of pressure on the Ottoman Sultan and his advisors to abolish the status of Vimy. And this decree, the Hatsi Humayun, was passed, which did many things. I mean, it was, it was a very important kind of reform decree, but it also technically abolished the status of Vimy. However, it did not introduce the kind of radical equality that, say, Napoleon introduced in France, because everybody, the Ottoman state and the Jews and the Christians, wanted to keep their distinctive and autonomous status. So Jews wanted to keep Jewish courts, which would have jurisdiction over Jews for Jewish matters like marriage and divorce and inheritance, etc., as did Christians, etc., etc. There was also a lot of controversy about whether Jews and Christians should serve in the army. Um, ultimately, they basically didn't allow them to serve in the army. Um, and interestingly, even though they abolished that special tax, the jizya, which was the kind of big mark of being a vimmi, they replaced it with a new tax, which got you out of army service. So in some ways, Jews were no longer vimmis. In other ways, not that much changed. Um, similarly, in Tunisia, the next year, they, they passed a sort of similar decree, the Ahad al-Aman, which, again, abolished the status of Vimmi, technically. But again, in Tunisia, it's not clear that that much changed for Jews. In Morocco, they did not abolish the status of Vimmi. And actually, it was not abolished until 1956, until Morocco became independent from the French Empire, just an aside. So, Again, even post Hatsi Humayun, even post-1856, which, by the way, is, I was happy to see is noted on the timeline of emancipation in the, in the, in the exhibit. Um, but, you know, again, it's, it, this, is, this is not a criticism, but it is hard to fit what's going on in the Ottoman Empire in North Africa into this narrative of emancipation, because the narrative of emancipation is really designed for a European context or a Western context. Okay, next let's talk about this category of national. So as I said, nationality in some ways is you know a lot about subjecthood. It's like which state do you belong to? It doesn't necessarily think about rights. Um, and the thing that I want to say is that the vast majority of everybody actually, not just Jews, but certainly Jews, lived their entire life happily, completely ignorant of their nationality. It wasn't something that you needed to know most of the time. Because you were born, you died, even if you traveled, most of the time you didn't need to prove your nationality to cross political borders. Political borders were open in the 19th century in the Middle East, North Africa, as they were in Europe. If you did need to have some sort of document, it wasn't like an identity paper the way we have passports today, which is this you know, really important proof of where do you belong or a birth certificate or something like that. It was a passport, it was called a passport of the 19th century, but it acted like a visa. Basically, it was given to you by the country to which you were going. And they usually didn't really care if you could approve your nationality or not. So most people, including Jews, lived their whole life not really knowing what their nationality was until something happened that forced them 
to prove it. So now we're going to go back to that case that I mentioned at the beginning, Leon Enos, this Jew from Algeria who had this you know, great experience getting the first Algerian Jew to pass the bar in France, and then he came, comes back to Algiers, and he's denied entry to the bar. And he takes, he takes the Bar Association to court, as any good lawyer would, and he sues them. And the court in Algiers agrees with the, the, the Bar Association and says, yeah, he's a, he's a colonial subject, not a French national. It's different. He's not really French, so he can't become a member of the Bar. But then he appeals it all the way up to the highest Supreme Court in Paris, and the Paris court disagrees. They say, no, Algerian Jews and Muslims are not citizens. We all agree on that. They don't have political rights. They can't vote. They're under their separate laws. They're different. But they're under French sovereignty. So what other nationality are they going to have? They must be French nationals. And they ruled that Enos, our Jewish lawyer, was a French national, and they forced the Algiers Bar Association to admit him. In some ways, this was one of the earliest definitions by any court anywhere of what nationality meant and how it differed from citizenship. Because remember, I said that nationality was a kind of new term for jurists in this period. Um, and later, the French legislator, the year later, so in 1865, they kind of gave their sort of legislative seal of approval, passed a very famous or infamous, depending on how you think about it, law called the Senatus Consult of July 14th, 1865, where they said, Algerian Jews are French nationals, but not citizens, and they are under Jewish law. Algerian Muslims are French nationals, but not citizens, and they are under Islamic law. We're going to get back to Algeria later on, because this story takes another turn five years later. So hold that in mind. The other time when things like nationality had to be proved, right, again, Enos, you know, until he applied to the Bar Association, all right, he became a member of the Bar in Paris, and nobody thought twice to think, are you French? Are you French national? Are you not? What are you? The other thing that often forced people to figure out what their nationality was, was dying. Because when you died, if you left behind any property, often it became important whom, which state you belong to, right, to figure out what to do with the property. So, of course, that's the case with Nisim Shamama. And that's, you know, the, the occasion for all of these long discussions, because when you have a lawsuit that goes on for 10 years, there's like a lot of paperwork that gets produced, and some of it turns out is very interesting. And what I'm most interested in for the Nisim Shamama case is that it occasioned these fascinating reflections on what it meant to be a Tunisian Jew in the 19th century, which tried to understand Tunisian nationality as emerging not from like Ottoman legislation, but from Islamic law itself. Now, in some ways, just for a little context, basically, uh, one of the arguments made in the course of the lawsuit was that Nisim Shamama couldn't have ever been a Tunisian national because Jews, as Vimis, were not nationals, right? They weren't actually members of the polity. They were like subjects or something, but not nationals. And one guy in particular, a, a man named Hossein ibn Abdallah, who was actually a, a official in the Tunisian government, but who got involved in this case and wrote these briefs first in Arabic, and then they were translated into French and Italian um, about the case of Nisim Shamama, explained that, you know, actually nationality in Islamic law is based on religion for Muslims, meaning that the fact that they are Muslim is the kind of basis of their nationality, and for non-Muslims, for Jews, on the Pact of Dhimma. So it was the fact of being a Dhimmi that made Nisim Shamama a Tunisian, right? And this, again, I think really gets to the point that I'm trying to make, that emancipation just doesn't really apply, because from Hussein's perspective, Jews are full members of the polity, right? And he goes even further. He says, Jews and Muslims are essentially equal before the law. They have the same rights and the same obligations. Right now, in some ways, that this particular formulation, the same rights and same obligations, is a little misleading because, of course, Dimis didn't have exactly the same rights and they didn't have exactly the same obligations. They paid different taxes. They didn't serve in the army, et cetera, et cetera. But, his, but actually, the French translation clarifies and says, uh, ils sont égaux devant la loi. They are equal before the law. And Hussein goes on to clarify that what he means is that Jews and Muslims are equally entitled to justice and thus equally part of 
the polity, equally members of the polity, and this is what nationality means. Thus, Jews in Tunisia are Tunisian nationals. Lest you think that this is just an argument made by Muslims, a kind of apologetics, there is also a Jew involved in the case, a man named Leon al melek or Eliyahu al meliach in Hebrew, who actually was originally Algerian but made his life in Tunisia and also wrote lots of pages of legal briefs about Nisim's nationality, trying to convince the courts that Nisim was a Tunisian. And he also says, Jews and Muslims are equal before the law. Yehudim shavim hema livnei mishpat im ha-Yishmaelim, with the Ishmaelites or Muslims as in modern uh, parlance. If this is all stuff you're interested in, I just wrote a book about this whole case, so you should feel free to learn more, but I don't want to only talk about Nisim Shabama tonight, so we'll move on um, to this category of protege, which again is probably the least familiar, um, but hopefully intriguing. So essentially, extraterritoriality was this absolutely important central legal category for the entire Mediterranean. And it meant that those with either foreign protection or foreign nationality were essentially under the jurisdiction of consular courts. They didn't pay local taxes, they couldn't be arrested by the police, and there were different ways of, of getting extraterritoriality, right? Some like were in the employ of a consulate, um, others went abroad and got naturalized, others bought their pat patents of protection on the black market. Um, and you know the, the point about extraterritoriality is that it really has nothing to do with citizenship as we think about it because political rights were totally not in the mix. Because all of these extraterritorials, nobody was voting by mail. They hadn't invented voting by mail. So even if they could have technically voted, that wasn't happening. What they cared about was jurisdiction, was taxes, always where they could be sued, where they could sue other people. So let's go back to the Russos from Chanakale, whom I mentioned at the beginning, right? Bechor Levi Russo, he tried to convince everybody that he was an American. The Ottomans finally kind of looked into the matter and were like, no, you're not an American protege. You're clearly an Ottoman subject. And then he went back and wrote another letter and said, no, no, okay, you're right. I was wrong. I'm not an American, but I am a British pro protege because I worked for the British consulate for a while as a dragoman, as a translator. So I'm under British protection. Then the next year, again, I don't know how this other Russo, his name is Isaac, I don't know how they're related, but the Russo family were all Drago men in Chanakali, so they're, they're certainly related. And he also turns out to have worked as a Drago man for the British consulate, and he gets accused of very serious theft, hundreds of thousands of francs of mostly like really nice jewelry, ruby diadem and like a diamond ring and like necklaces with emeralds, really nice stuff, which he stole from another Jew's house who was also under British protection um, and then, you know, made away with and then this poor Jew died and his widow is trying to recover the property. And everybody's trying to figure out where do we sue this guy? Where does Isaac Russo get sued? Do we sue him in the British court? He's no law. He got fired from being a dragoman from the consulate, as you can imagine, after stealing somebody's household worth of jewels. Um, but, you know, still now, now is he Ottoman? Finally, finally, the British ambassador in Istanbul concludes that, quote, the family of Russo are not entitled to British nationality. Now, whether he did that because these guys were clearly troublemakers and he just wanted them out of his jurisdiction, or whether he actually looked into the matter and decided, yeah, no, these guys are not actually British protégés, they're just Ottomans and they're just trying to sort of, you know, use protection to their advantage, we won't know. But these kinds of stories are all over the place in the 19th century M Middle East and North Africa. And again, they show that belonging, right, legal belonging wasn't really about voting or even civil rights. It was really about jurisdiction, forum shopping, right, getting as many possible actors into the mix to your advantage. Okay, finally, let's talk a little bit about citizenship. As I said, citizenship isn't really an operative category except for Algeria. Algeria was colonized in 1830, and at first, right, when we talked about the Enos case, Jews were colonial subjects, so they did not have political rights, right? Um, but many Jews, both in France and in Algeria, wanted more than just colonial subjects. They wanted more than just nationality. Um, 
uh, oh, sorry, here's a map of colonial Algeria. In 1869, hundreds of Jews signed this really fascinating bilingual petition in Judeo-Arabic and in French, basically saying, we want to become French citizens. We are willing to give up Jewish law, give up the jurisdiction of the Bate Din of Jewish courts in order to become full citizens of France. Luckily, they had serious champions among the Jews of France who thought, wow, if we could just give all of these Algerian Jews French citizenship, we would be able to assimilate them and civilize them and make them into good, enlightened, Western, civilized Jews much, much more quickly. So they lobbied people and um, head amongst them was this man, Adolphe Cremieux, who was um, a sort of politician, mainly a lawyer, actually Nisim Shamama's lawyer at one point, um, and eventually, in 1870, in the midst of a war, he got to be the Minister of Justice, briefly, for just a few months. But he did really serious work while he was in the administration. He pushed through a decree called the Cremieux Decree, which made the Jews in Algeria, or at least in those northern bits of Algeria, which were annexed to France. Actually, that big yellow part, which is the Algerian Sahara, the Jews there were not emancipated. But in the northern bit, in the green bit, all of those Jews overnight became French citizens. And this is the really the only place in the Middle East and North Africa where Jews were full citizens of a state. And it's because Algeria was France. It wasn't even just a French colony. It was actually part of France, the way Alaska is part of the United States, right? A non-contiguous territory. Of course, the fact that Jews in Algeria were, emancip were emancipated along the model of French emancipation by the, the Crémieux Decree doesn't mean that anti-Semitism ended. In fact, it was quite the opposite. The emancipation of Jews, the, the granting of voting rights to Jews in Algeria launched this really intense and ugly period of anti-Semitism that was you know, that's known as the Dreyfus Affair in France, but even before that, the Algerian settlers were amongst the most vicious anti-Semites anti anywhere in the French Empire. Um, and indeed, if you if you know a little bit about the, the Dreyfus Affair, um, the, the most kind of, um, I don't know, infamous, I guess I should say, uh, anti-Semite who was really kind of egging on uh, the anti-Dreyfusard was a man named Edouard Drummond who had written this really kind of awful book called La France Juive, Jewish France, which was just a, a very long two volume anti-Semitic screed, who got elected to French parliament where? In Algiers, the center of French anti-Semitism. So again, you know, and this is very much what you'll see in the exhibit that emancipation was not one and done. It was very much a kind of piecemeal process that went forwards and backwards. So I'll end by just saying that hopefully I've convinced you both that the history of citizenship for Jews in the North Africa and the Middle East is of interest and also that these terms, citizenship, emancipation, don't quite fit and that we have to kind of think about these other categories. Um, and I think what's, what's so interesting about that though and what makes that worthwhile is of course the inherent interest of Jews from the Sephardic and Mizrahi world, but also the idea that rights and citizenship and belonging wasn't one thing or another. It wasn't an on-off switch. There was a spectrum. There were a number of ways in which people could belong. And there were a number, of, a number of models of what it meant to have equality and what it meant to be full members of a state. Now, a lot of this has kind of fallen by the wayside, for better or for worse, but that's part of what history is so interesting, is so helpful for, is that it kind of makes us rethink what we think of as just the natural way of the world and the kind of teleology. And pause and say, oh, wow, things looked really different back then. And ultimately, I think that can help us reimagine our present and then hopefully our future. So with that, we'll take questions. Thanks. I'm, I'm assuming that you're, what you are saying is that France controlled life in Algeria. All right, and uh, the Dimmies? I had professions that they pursued. They paid maybe special taxes, uh, but they lived a relatively economic uh, free life. Why 
what what would be the advantage mm. for France to make them citizens? Oh. Mm. Mm. I, you know, where why would they why would they want to be citizens? It seems as though when they're dimmies, they don't have to go into the army. Mm -hmm. They don't have to go, mm -hmm. you know, defend um, Algeria or mm -hmm. Morocco mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. So why would the French want them to be citizens? Yep. That's an excellent question, really excellent question. So the first thing I'll just say is that actually, I, I mean, I didn't, I wasn't able to go into all of the details, but when France comes to Algeria in 1830, they kind of get rid of the existing models for belonging. So Jews are no longer Dhimmis after 1830. But what's kind of interesting and what uh, a very wonderful um, Moroccan historian, Abdallah Larouy, has written is that what the French did is they essentially inverted the Vimmi relationship. So instead of Muslims being on top and Jews and Christians being below, they put Christians, French, on top and then Jews and Muslims below. So that's just some context. But this question, why? Why did the commune decree? Why? Well, it's clear, I think it's pretty clear why French Jews wanted it because they had a real sense of solidarity with. Jews all over the world. The Alliance Israelite Universelle, also featured in the exhibit, is this really, really important Jewish organization. It's often thought of as a French or Jewish organization, and it was based in Paris, but it was truly a global organization. There were chapters all over the world, and it was fighting for Jews' rights all over the world and Jews' welfare. Eventually, they opened this huge network of schools. So for the Jews in France, right, they saw themselves as able to really help their co-religionists. And, and that, I think, is really what motivated people like Chemia. But what about the rest of the Frenchmen? Why, why would they be interested? First of all, many of them weren't. And as soon as the Kremio decree was passed, there was, there was blowback. There was a lot of opposition to it. Kind of amazingly, it wasn't repealed until Vichy, until, until, the, until World War II, when the Vichy regime took over. And then immediately, one of the first things they did was repeal the Kremio decree and strip Algerian Jews of their French citizenship. The blowback came from anti-Semites, especially uh, anti-Semites in um, Algeria, and actually just generally all of the colonizers in Algeria. In France, though, there was a not insignificant faction of non-Jewish French people who supported the idea of making Jews citizens because they saw Jews in Algeria as more assimilable than Muslims, right? And there was... Colonization, colonialism is very complicated, right? So there's no one way to really talk about it. But there was part of the kind of colonialist mentality which saw the mission of France as a civilizing mission, a mission civilisatrice. They were there in Algeria to make Algerians civilized, right? To bring them civilization, to bring them the enlightenment, to bring them freedom, to bring them all of those things. And they, their, their general feeling was that Muslims were more likely to oppose that. They weren't interested. They were more, um, you know, they were, they were inherently more opposed to colonialism. But Jews were these kind of natural intermediaries. And if they could get the Jews on board, then their whole mission civilisatrice would be more successful. So this was one sort of strand within French politics in the 19th century that, you know, Cremieux was able to kind of work together with liberal Frenchmen, non-Jews, who didn't have like a particular interest in helping Jews, but, you know, wanted the colonial project in Algeria to succeed. But it was also, you know, the kind of serendipity of him being minister in this period that was, there, there was a lot of turmoil and and, you know, it's, it's, I, mean, I was just talking with Gav about counterfactual history. It is so easy to come up with a counterfactual where the French never give citizenship to Algerian Jews, and Algerian history looks totally different, especially Algerian Jewish history. Because Algerian Jews, unlike Jews elsewhere in the Middle East and North Africa, 98% after Algerian independence all went to France, right? Whereas elsewhere, many went to Israel, France, Europe, the United States, I mean, all sorts of places. There was a big diaspora. Algerian Jews, vast majority, just went to France because they thought of themselves as French, as French citizens. Oh, hi, we enjoyed everything so far. 
Did I miss something? What happened to the grand niece? Did she get the, ah. the, the fortune? Oh, you'll have to read the book. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, I could tell. I'll no. wait for the movie. No, you didn't miss anything. Um, yeah, right. Well, I, I live in Los Angeles, but I, I'm not really in those circles. I, yeah, academics, we don't really have a line to Hollywood. Um, she uh, did, but. By that point, after 10 years, literally all of the heirs had spent all of the money that they might have inherited on lawyers. And, and the guy who got the money is this sleazy French banker of Jewish origin, but whose father had converted to Catholicism back in Germany, who had come to France, um, who very you know, shrewdly went around buying up all the shares from all of the family members, including the niece. So he was the only one who actually made any money. Mm. Yeah, write, write a good will. <laughs> uh, great talk, I really learned a ton and it got me to think about a little bit of comparative history mm. from a macroscopic perspective and while I know, and I'm sure you'd probably agree, the historians aren't in the business of generating iron laws of historical causality and how things always tend to occur, it strikes me that when you take the French imposition from an Algerian perspective of equality uh, to Jews, when you think of Napoleon exporting equal rights to Jews in the Holy Roman Empire, when you think of the North imposing emancipation on the black population from the South Southern, Confederate perspective, Southern Confederacy's perspective and the US invasion of Iraq and the back. Each one of these external impositions of equality or liberal universal rights generates a backlash, yeah. which raises the counterfactual question, would it have been better, would everyone have just been better off, again, hazards of generalization, mm -hmm. if the domestic population had just resolved these things internally on their own terms or would any of these emancipatory causes ever gotten anywhere were it not for the external imposition of them. So I'm not no, asking, no. you know, to you solve this conundrum, yeah. but what do you think about right. these comparative instances? I mean, it's a it's such a good question. I, you know, I, I really am, this is recorded, so I'm not going to say anything about what is good or bad or what should have happened, but I will say that you can very clearly see how differently the trajectory in particular of Jewish-Muslim relations went in Algeria, where Jews were French citizens, thought of themselves for the most part as allied with France. There were a few Jews who basically refused that and said, no, we're Algerians, we're staying here, and they stayed. But the vast majority said, well, we're French, so we're gonna go to France. And there was you know, much less sense of a kind of common nationalism among Jews in Algeria than in Tunisia and Morocco, where that didn't happen. There was no Kremia decree in Tunisia or Morocco. Now, Tunisia and Morocco were colonized by the French, Tunisia in 1881, Morocco in 1912, but they were not annexed to France the way Algeria was. So they were very different politically. France didn't come in and replace the existing political structure. They left the existing government in place basically as a kind of puppet government, and then they kind of ran things from behind the scenes. But when it comes to Jews, they basically said, Tunisian Jews are Tunisian, and they still have you know, autonomy, but they are Tunisian. Moroccan Jews are Moroccan. And in fact, the, the first kind of official nationality laws passed in Tunisia and Tunisian Morocco were passed under the auspices of the French colonial state. Now, Again, colonialism, complicated, not necessarily a great thing. However, in these cases, um, the French did not, they, there was a certain amount of divide and conquer, for sure, but they did not um, separate out Jews as a distinctive political community nearly to the extent that had happened in Algeria. So when there was a nationalist movement in Morocco and Tunisia, there were many more opportunities for Jews to participate. It's not all Jews did. Many Jews basically were like, well, Tunisia is, you know, Tunisian nationalism is based on an Arab and Islamic identity, and we're neither Arab nor Muslim, so we're kind of excluded. Many people made the same conclusion in Morocco. But the, the kind of 
percentage of Jews in Morocco and Tunisia, respectively, who really thought of themselves as Moroccan or Tunisian and who stayed following independence from France in 1956 was much higher than Algeria. And the reasons for departure are, are much more complicated, right? Really, Algeria was the brutal war for independence and then uh, departure en masse with the rest of the French settlers. In Algeria and Tunisia, it was a much more kind of slow, piecemeal, Many left long before independence, after uh, the, the creation of the State of Israel. You know, they, wa they wanted to go to Israel, or they wanted the economic opportunities, or they really believed in the Zionist project. Um, so in that sense, you know, again, it's not a perfect analogy, but you can really see how differently things worked out in a place where Jews were given citizenship, French citizenship and where they were not. Uh, thank you for the, for the talk. Um, you mentioned that uh, the the status of Demi was was abolished here, and the status right. of, was abolished there. Did this status of Demi Hood uh, exist in all Muslim countries? And does any of its any Muslim country still uh, have it? Huh. That's a good question. As far as I know, it has since been abolished everywhere. Um, I will say that. ISIS, the Islamic State, you know, one of the things they wanted to do was bring back the status of Dhimmi. Uh, sorry? Oh, a uh, Dhimmi, yeah. So Dhimmi is this, um, the, the, the technical term in Arabic for a protected non-Muslim living under Islamic rule, right? Um, a kind of, you know, pre-19th century status, but which persisted well into the 20th century in some places. And um, yes, it was, it, so when exactly the status arose is sort of a matter of some debate, right? Traditionally, Muslims say, oh, it, it comes from the second caliph, the second caliph, Omar, and he wrote a treatise, a treatise um, sort of basically granting protection to Christians, and that became the model for the Ahl al for Dhimmis, from the seventh century on. Historians think probably it was much later, like around the ninth century, this started to develop as a legal status. Um, but it's, it's quite amazing, actually, like if you, I mean, when I was working in the archives in Morocco, I found discussions about the rights of Jews that referred back to this purported seventh century document to basically outline what Jews should and should not be allowed to do in 19th century Morocco. So there is an enormous amount of continuity. Um, and, and you see that throughout the Islamic world. Technically, the people who are eligible for Dhimmi status are supposed to be monotheists. They're supposed to be people of the book, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians. But in India, the Mughals, the reigning uh, Islamic uh, empire made Hindus into Dhimmis, and Hindus definitely not monotheistic, or at least pretty clearly not. And um, so, you know, the, it was also one of these kind of flexible, rather capacious legal categories, um, which, um, you know, really did in many ways structure relationships between Muslims and non-Muslims. And again, you know, it was not a model of radical equality, but there were rights as part of the status of being a Dhimmi, right? You did have a set of rights. I want to thank Jessica Marlin again for kicking off this series so beautifully. Thank you so much.